Yeah, what a beautiful forest, huh? Looks like something straight out of Jurassic Park. It's really quite spectacular. This is a coastal old growth temperate rainforest and ecosystems like this are incredibly unique. Ones with this mix of species from cedars and spruces to Douglas firs in the interior only exist here in Cascadia and nowhere else in the entire world. They've evolved over thousands of years which makes them much older than modern society and while they used to cover most of Cascadia from Northern California up to Alaska, they're actually incredibly rare these days and increasingly under threat. Some reports estimate that between only 5 and 3 percent of these original forests remain from their original numbers between the US and Canada, yet most people can hardly tell the difference between these ecosystems and the second and third growth forests that cover the hillsides surrounding them. So I thought I'd point out some of the different factors that differentiate these forests and what makes ones like this so dang awesome. But before we get into any of that, it's really important to note that the term old growth can often mean different things depending on who's using it. It's kind of complicated, I'm sorry. So originally the term old growth referred to a forest at late stage succession or climax forest, which can vary greatly depending on where in the world the forest is and what it's made of. For example, an old growth forest in the Rockies is going to look a lot different from an old growth forest out here on the coast. Then in the 60s and 70s during the environmental movement, the term old growth came to mean a forest that hadn't had any human involvement, although that's inherently flawed because humans, you know, we're we're just animals too and we've always had active roles in these ecosystems. But to counter that, the logging industry came up with their own definition for old growth which means a forest over 150, sometimes 250 years old and this is often used as a blanket statement to include forests that may actually grow to maturity over a much longer time frame than that as well as forests that were originally logged in the 16 and 1700s that have regrown somewhat but still aren't the original forests that they once were. In this video, when I use the term old growth, I'm specifically referring to virgin ancient forest ecosystems that haven't had any western development or disturbances with respect to the indigenous nations and communities who have always worked within and lived within these forest ecosystems since time immemorial. Alright, now let's go check them out. Alright, so first things first, in an ancient forest, let's start by looking at the ground. What are the first things you notice, huh? Pretty, uh, pretty difficult to navigate, probably pretty hard to walk through here, right? The ground's really uneven. We've got pit and mound topography with, you know, holes created from root systems that have been ripped up from wind throw. We've got fallen over logs, lots of woody debris. Things are rotting and decaying. We've got ponds forming, dens forming. There's stuff, you know, just kind of happening all over the place. It's difficult to walk through. That means that this is a really old, healthy, mature forest ecosystem with life growing on life kind of all over the place. Now here we are in a second growth forest for contrast. Take a look at the ground. What do you notice? Aside from the odd stick here or there, I mean it's, it's relatively flat, pretty clear, fairly easy to walk through to get around in, and the biggest obstacles you're going to encounter are big old stumps from the remnant forest that used to be here. I mean you quite literally can see how at one point everything was removed from this environment and these trees planted here. All right, so now let's look up from the ground and at the actual trees. In an ancient forest ecosystem, you'll see diversity of all sorts of different kinds. You know, everything from, from big cedars to medium-sized cedars to twisting hemlocks and sicka spruces and all sorts of different other hemlocks and stuff in the understory. And this diversity of species at different ages and sizes is a key component of a healthy functioning forest ecosystem because it demonstrates resilience. If, say, a disease or a fire or an insect infestation were to come in here, it would only affect a small population of the trees that would be susceptible to that and the forest ecosystem overall would pretty much continue going on just as it always had. Now let's have a look at this second growth forest. I mean all these trees are similar species all planted at the same time, same distance in between them. Not a ton of diversity here. I mean it's a pretty volatile and at-risk forest. If some sort of disturbance were to come through like a fire per se, all these trees would go up in flames because there's no resilience built into the ecosystem with the bigger older trees who are more fire resilient or you know spacing that keeps the fire from spreading. Which is exactly what we're seeing with our longer, harder, drier summers every year and the crazy fire seasons we're experiencing because of our second growth forests that are all monocultures of the same tree, same volatility to fire. All right, so next we're gonna have a look at some of these different trees' morphologies, or the shapes they take on, which can often be twisted and gnarly as a testament to living. And you can learn a lot about what a tree's had to go through to endure and survive just by looking at the way it is. For example, this big western red cedar here, looking at its root structure, you can see that at one point it was growing on top of an old nurse log that's since been, you know, decayed, that it landed on as a seed, which just makes its story, you know, even more fascinating. And you can see the story at play all around the forest. You know, there's always a big tree falling over that's becoming a nurse log to a bunch of different saplings. Or these these hemlocks that are growing on this cedar slowly breaking it down in this constant battle of decay and growth, life and death. And it's this same struggle that helps build really strong wood, you know? Many of these big trees around here began their lives in the understory in the shade growing really slowly for hundreds of years creating really tightly packed, sturdy heartwood that allows them to grow up and endure the elements that come their way. 
Yet here in a second growth forest, we can see that things are pretty bland really. You know, all these trees are uniform in, in size and shape. Not a lot of creativity to living here. You know, there's no thriving nurse logs or trees growing on other trees. None of these trees germinated here then had to figure out how to survive. They were all planted here. Whereas in an old growth forest ecosystem, a tree grows for hundreds of years slowly in the shade, making really tight grain in its heartwood so that it can be big, strong, and resilient when it does get sunlight. All these trees grew up in a very sun-rich environment, which means that they grew straight up tall and fast to replace the forest. But as a result, they have more spaced out grain, which makes them more susceptible to wind throw and generally makes weaker wood overall. So now let's look at these systems as a whole. As I've mentioned before, old growth forests are constantly in a state of growth and decay, life and death. So life must start here in the shadows, patiently waiting for its chance to get sunlight so that it can grow. And this often happens during what's known as a disturbance event. Maybe some branches crack off in a windstorm or a big tree topples over because of root rot. Whatever happens, it creates a gap in the canopy that allows sunlight to come in and reach all layers within the forest, creating rich layers of vegetation from herbaceous layers on the forest floor of different mosses and ferns to salal and huckleberry to smaller trees like hemlock and vine maple to big trees like cedars and spruces where up in those branches are housed a bunch of different lichens and mosses. When we think of forests we tend to only think of them for the trees but the reality is is that all this rich vegetation is what stores a vast amount of the carbon in these forests as well as performing all the ecological functions that we need to survive. It's part of a bigger system and everything has its place. Now here we are back in our second growth forest and you can see that all that vegetation doesn't really exist here. These tightly packed trees often create a canopy that's so dense, very little light comes through. And as a result, we rarely see the rich sort of vegetative understory in a second growth forest um, and instead have more bare forest floors that's usually dominated by a single species like this deer fern here. We've lost all that vegetation and all the carbon storing of our original forest when we cut it down. It's a pretty bleak and dismal scene, isn't it? I mean, in our race to optimize these resources to meet an ever-growing demand, we've ended up getting rid of all of the things that makes them so great in the first place. Where an old growth forest is a healthy, functioning, diverse forest ecosystem, these second growth forests are nothing more than crops, no different from a cornfield where a prairie used to be. That's why it's so crucial that we separate our idea of what we think a forest is or should be from these plantation forests, because once these ecosystems are gone, they're literally gone for thousands of years, which in human terms is basically forever. If you live in the lower 48, it's probably been a while since you've heard about protecting old growth forests in the Northwest, right? Well, sadly, that's because there's nothing left to protect. All that currently exists today is in small protected areas or national parks and everything else has long been cut down. The few remaining ancient forests that exist on public land in Alaska or on Crown Land in BC are still actively being logged today and transformed into these second growth forests. This isn't a US problem or a Canadian problem, it's a Cascadian problem and we're all in this together. If we want to protect these ecosystems for future generations, we need to call upon our elected officials and implement some real change. That's right, I said it, the big C word, change. Probably the most terrifying and triggering word to some folks, and rightfully so. I mean, change is difficult, it's uncomfortable, it's uncertain, but it may also be just what we need to create a better future for us all. Despite things looking bleak, there actually is hope for doing things a new way, and it may just work out for the best. I mean, change is the only constant in life, and even these second growth forests are eventually going to change and mature into healthy forest ecosystems if we let them do so, but that's going to require an entirely new train of thought. Through extremely selective logging practices, we can incorporate old growth characteristics back into the second and third growth forests, which is not only going to increase biodiversity and ecological resilience, but maintain logging jobs and economy that support our communities. We can look beyond the 70 year crop rotations to much more frequent yet significantly smaller harvests, which is going to not only add ecological resilience, but create better wood for us while sequestering and storing carbon from the atmosphere. We can create smaller woodlots that actually look out for the long term economic and ecological good of the communities that manage them. Collectively, we need to let go of our attachments to the way we've been doing things so that we can do things better. We can't change the past, but we can acknowledge our faults, exercise some humility, and work together today to create a better world for tomorrow. Oh dang, what a beauty! If you're enjoying these videos, feel free to keep on watching, subscribe to my channel, or help support their production by becoming a patron at the Patreon page below. I've got all sorts of sweet perks there, as well as stickers and merch available at nerdyaboutnature.com. Because nature, it's pretty neat, you know? The more you know about it, the more fun you're going to have next time you're out there enjoying it. God, there's just so much green, you know? I've never seen this much green before.